Water. Water is life. Water is civilization. The moment anyone diverts the water from the river, a community is born. And a sequia takes life. Aldama is an 18th century town located downstream of Ciudad Chihuahua, Mexico. Its very infrastructure has water at the core. Three acequias run through the town square, channeling water to properties all over town. This small oasis can only be sustained by the continual flow of the acequia waters. Aldama literally symbolizes the power and importance of the water. Aldama was a blank slate, nothing more than desert until the settlers harnessed the Isequia water from the Rio Conchos. Every ditch was dug by hand. Every tree was planted on their hands and knees. And now, each Isequia is connected to its own Alameda, or cottonwood orchard. The cottonwoods provide much needed shade from the desert sun, which prevents the water from evaporating. With the dramatic growth of Chihuahua City, more and more effluent water has been flowing downstream into Aldama. In recent years, the township has begun to pump water from the underground aquifers to fill the acequias with pure water. In doing this, the people can guarantee that the land will not be polluted from the big city's effluence. These pumps also aid the town in times of drought. Aldama has taken a stand to preserve the traditions that the town was founded upon. Esther Hermosillo is an educator and activist. She has made her purpose in life to remind everyone of Aldama's original vision. She works hard to remind others of the value of the sustainable utopia. She aims to preserve their ancestors' vision of life by the waterside, where everyone has equal access to clean, pure, life-giving water. Southwest of Paral, Chihuahua's fifth largest city lies the city of Santa Barbara. This is a 17th century mining town and it's gone through different periods. The Spanish crown of course began everything and in 1960 everything was uh, was nationalized and Mexico bought all of the stock interests and in all of the mines so it's, the mines are all owned by Mexican capital right now. Santa Barbara is relatively small approximately 9,000 people but the mining industry is very large. Mining has become an important part of this city's economy. In fact, it is important to this entire region of Mexico. For centuries, people have been excavating ore from the surrounding mountains. Ore contains several different minerals that can be processed and separated after excavation. The mines of Santa Barbara have exported many minerals Gold, silver, zinc, to name a few, but most notably, lead. Mario Maceas is a private miner who has lived in Santa Barbara his whole life. Having grown up in the city, Mario knows where to find the minerals. He knows where to find the ore. It's part of folk knowledge passed down throughout his family. It's in his blood. He is a gambusino. A gambusino can be seen as the evolution of a placero, or a placer miner. Placer in Spanish means pleasure, and that's the stuff that you can that you can just uh, find in the sand and the rivers. There was placer mining here. This began with placer mining, with placeres, what they call placeres, in the river here. People would just come and and look at the sand and just pick out the gold and uh, and the silver, and then they. Uh, you start with that and you kind of follow it up. You follow it up to see where the vetas are, where the, where the veins are, and that's where you begin your, your mining.
Pero aquí puede haber oro. Una piedra de estas. Me vine toda, toda una tarde con los gambosinos. Y I came here one afternoon with the gambosinos. They lowered me down into this trench. You can see the vein where the gold is. There was a man with a stone grinding little pieces of rock, and he said, look, it's gold, but I couldn't see it. They were washing the crushed pieces in the cuerno and tossing out the dirt. They looked like normal rocks. They said, look, it's gold. I still didn't see anything. It's not bright, it's dull, so it was hard to tell. They showed me a little piece, and I said, now I see the gold, but it turned out to be pyrite. Ah, era pirita. Era pirita. Pirita, pirita's pyrite, it's fool's gold. Sí, el oro de los tontos. Pero los gambusinos aquí, se meten ocho gentes. There were eight people here that day, and they only extracted one gram of gold, worth about 80 to 100 pesos. They divided the money between them, 20 pesos per family. It is very hard, but they are poor and need the money to eat. Pero es muy triste la vida del gambusino. Del gambusino claro. The life of the gambusino is very sad. They'll come, they'll get a little box of this stuff, and they'll take it home and process it in little backyard uh, mills down in the town. On, on weekends, you can hear them, you can hear them operating and grinding. They'll throw the good stuff like this in there. In their in their little mills, and then run it through the uh, the homemade the homemade uh, refining process. He said he put about uh, 40 kilos of, uh, of ore in there of, of, uh, of little rocks, and the. He turns on the tau nut for about an hour, and it, it pulverizes everything. And he said the he said the finer parts of the ore, the, what they call the concentrate, actually falls to the bottom. And that's what he's got in that in that, uh, in that rag. And he put the mercury in the rag, and it, and the gold sticks to the mercury. He says he's got maybe two and a half grams of gold uh, in there. But first, he's got to burn the mercury bead, which is uh, he's been handling he's been handling the bead. Uh, with direct skin co contact, which is, which is not a great idea, but you know people have been doing it for hundreds of years around here, and, and uh, I don't know what the average lifespan is of a gambusino, but we wish them good health and, uh, and well-being, of course. Although Mario and his family have been doing this for many generations, the mining corporations have deemed this kind of lifestyle as illegal. The word gambusino is roughly translated to gleaner in English. Corporations view them as scavengers, stealing minerals from their land. They've branded gambusinos like Mario as burglars and thieves. To the companies, the owners of the estates, they are stealing minerals. They're tolerated because they are excellent scouters. They know where the mineral is, they look for it, despite the cost. So where there is much work for the gambusinos, the companies will follow. The gambusino is Mexican, he is Indian, he is the owner proprietor of this land. The companies come and say, what a thief. Why? Whether you are a gambusino or a corporate miner, Water is very important for the excavation process. For the weekend miner like Mario, water from the acequias lubricates the tauna, or the pulverizer. It also allows them to easily collect the concentrated minerals. For large mining companies, water not only acts as a lubricant, it also cools off the heavy machinery and filters the air deep underground. Excess water from the mines is pumped back into the river. It flows slowly into the valley to the north. Much of this water contains mercury, lead, and other impurities left over from the mines.
In an effort to prevent the spread of these impurities, villagers built this dam in 1909. The dam had two primary functions. First, to catch the rogue mercury at the bottom of the dam. As mercury is a metal, it was thought that it would sink and remain at the base of the dam, unable to continue downstream. Its second function was to regulate the water flow to the acequias that feed the farms downstream. A valve at the top of the dam allows farmers to increase and decrease the amount of water at any given time. Nature, it seems, has developed a third function for this dam. Every summer, thousands of carp migrate to this reservoir to mate. Interestingly enough, Carp is native to Europe and Asia, and was introduced to Mexico by the Spaniards in the 1500s. Water flows away from the dam. Now channeled by the Ezequias, it is directed where man wants it to go. As we follow the Asekia, the land surrounding the water becomes more and more lush. Vegetation grows thick all around the ditch. The Asekia water brings life to this arid climate. It brings life to where there was nothing more than just dirt. It brings life. It is life. Water and the Asequias give birth to new possibilities. Approximately 12 miles from Paral lies the village of Talemantes. It is here that a local man and his family have done the impossible. They have created a self-sustainable tilapia farm in the middle of the arid desert. Tilapia is yet another fish brought to Mexico by outside settlers. It is a freshwater fish that can only survive in warm climates and is usually found in tropical locations such as Costa Rica. Victor Hernandez Jimenez diverts water from his acequia to fill his ponds where he farms tilapia and azul toro. Victor has two ponds, one for the newborn tilapia and the larger pond for adult fish. Tilapia breed rapidly, so Victor keeps a few black bass, a natural predator of tilapia, to regulate the fish's population. Alongside his fish farm, Victor owns Restaurant El Tigre, one of the only seafood restaurants in the desert. Ingredients are always fresh and always in stock. Victor has taken the culture and tradition of Ezequiel life and applied it in a totally new direction. This type of innovation is what reminds us that the old ways are not gone. It shows us that we can hold on to our culture and still move forward into the future. In this sense, culture becomes as self-sustainable as Victor's fish farm. Just as Victor applied science and aquaculture to his Sekia tradition, we too can apply new concepts toward water culture. The idea of water culture in a Sekia tradition has so far been applied to the mining industry and aquaculture. Meet Blanca Vijerano. Her family has been distilling Sotol, an alcoholic beverage with similar properties to tequila, for as long as she can remember. Her factory is located in the suburbs of Ciudad Chihuahua. We cook the agave much like the Indian style of barbecue. In a, in a hole like this, you cover it with rocks, 
and then you put on a lot of fire in there, and when it's very hot, then you place uh, the, the meat or, or the heads of the agave, and then you cover it, and then you leave it there, and so uh, the, the heat is irradiated, and, and, and it's a very slow cooking. Here we add wood to keep the fire hot. It takes five hours to heat. So after it's really hot, after five hours, they place all the heads of the sotol in there. They cut the leaves out with a special, the, the guy who does that in the south is called himador. He's a guy who, with a special uh, knife, cuts the leaves of the sotol and, and brings the, the whole head, which is like a head, and, and then they put him in there. And then they cover it with palm leaves, and then they cover it with earth. Sometimes we use volcanic stone. There's a problem with this method, however. When we cook the agave this way, we have to first remove all the stones and set them aside. We then start a fire in this pit. Once the fire is hot, we cover it with the stones. The heads are placed on top of the stones and covered with palm trees and dirt. When we take out the agave, the meat is tender. After the sotol is cooked, the heads are loaded onto this platform. They cut the heads into pieces with an axe and grind them in their mill. When the grinding process is complete, the milled agave heads are placed in these containers to cool. This is where the fermentation process begins. We add water and let it sit for several days. In cold weather, it takes 10 to 12 days to ferment. In hot weather, it only takes seven. Once the fermentation process has come to an end, the liquid is transported into a large still. In order to brew her family's traditional recipe, Vaca must use the acequia water to fill her boilers and to cool down her equipment. These giant boilers are heated by a large fire we build underneath them. The first distilling process is complete. To show us what happens next, Blanca takes us back to the sipping room. This is the traditional style of drinking sotul. By drinking out of these, we can determine the grade of each batch of sotul we create. The horns have specific measurements. By mixing and tasting from the horns, the distillers can determine the grade of the alcohol. There are three batches that we brew. The middle batch is always the best. There are different alcohol grades from the beginning to the end. There are many ingredients. The process takes a long time. It's very expensive. Water plays a miraculous part in the lives of the people living in Chihuahua. It contributes to the economy of a country by making the mining industry possible. It provides nourishment to the plant life and livestock. It allows us to celebrate with traditional beverages. It even creates an environment to sustain a fish farm. Water means so much to the people of the desert. Every year on June 24th, locals celebrate El Dia de San Juan Baptista, or St. John the Baptist. On this day, all fresh running water is declared holy by the Catholic Church. Children play in the street, splashing the cars as they drive by. Adults wash their cars and bless them in the river water. One particular village knows how to celebrate above all others. It just so happens they take this day very seriously, as St. John is their patron saint and namesake of their village. The small chapel is open to everyone with signs of peace and a portrait of Jesus hanging outside. The locals of the small village of San Juan come together at the town square and celebrate with water fights and matachin dances. Local pig farmers cook chicharron for everyone to eat. A 
watermelon farmer shares his crop with the locals. A man even gives cotton candy to the kids. The villagers enjoyed the time with each other, with the land, and most importantly, with the water. Matechines are religious dancers who perform in groups, usually to celebrate feast days or religious holidays. Matechin dances are heavily influenced by the Catholic belief and also by native traditions. Many dance groups pay homage to both of these cultures by adorning themselves with traditionally native dressings which have Catholic symbols and icons decorating them. Los Matechines de San Juan dance all afternoon and celebrate their champion, the water. The beauty of this holiday is that the people celebrate water. While they do acknowledge the importance of St. John the Baptist, they celebrate what water symbolizes purity, rebirth, and life. <laughs> 